So I just got back from a run and I find that it helps my aging legacy biological systems to get a refresh, to dust out the cobwebs, so to speak. And I wonder whether the eventual almighty AI system software that's going to replace me will need to do the same thing. Or maybe it'll just get clogged up with junk and stop working. It's hard to know with these things. Hey there, welcome to The Drawing Codex. A lot of people seem to be talking about AI-generated art recently. I'm not quite sure why, but I think it's an interesting subject, especially if you're an aspiring artist and you're starting out your journey and you're wondering how does this affect you? What does it mean? Does it mean you stop studying drawing? Is software or AI or whatever people are saying going to replace your job, right? Are you going to have some reason to exist as an artist in the future? I'm not particularly worried about this personally from my career standpoint. Um, and although I think some people might be worried for good reason, depending on what they do artistically, I think the more important thing here is to think about this as a really good way to Think about how we build careers and think about how technology and automation affects the way that we do create art and how we can protect ourselves from that as artists from a career standpoint. What I want to do is give you five basic reasons that outline why I'm not too worried about AI generated art. And I'll also share with you some tips and career advice and things that I think are worth focusing on for your career going forward to make sure that you're putting your best foot forward when it comes to employability and making sure that you have value in the marketplace. All right, welcome again to The Drawing Codex. My name's Tim McBurney. I've been a professional working artist in a sea of technological change for over 20 years. And on this channel, we're actually all about the more traditional drawing methods. Even though we do it digitally, we're all about drawing cool stuff from our imagination, embracing the challenge of drawing, and mastering the craft of line and color illustration, which, even though is still very relevant, has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, if you want to learn a little bit more about my journey and some advice that I have for picture making and illustration in general, you can check out my free illustration workshop. I talk a lot about how I went from being someone who was not very good at art at all to becoming a professional artist and a published author and comic book artist. And I give you some advice for getting more polish and detail in your work and thinking about working professionally. It's free. Link will be in the the description. Go check it out. So I'm an 80s kid and I watched Terminator and I was traumatized like many of us by James Cameron's vision of artificial intelligence gone wild and gone rogue to the point where it basically destroys humanity and really makes a mess of things. And I've also been part of the digital art revolution. I started very early on in the digital realm and I've been working in video games and a lot of these artistic entertainment design industries that have seen massive technological change over time. We've gone from digital art being not accepted to being something that is accepted. We've seen the concepts of photo bashing, using 3D in our work, etc., etc., etc. This has been something that's constantly changing and constantly evolving. Now, the first point I want to make is one of essentially semantics. And this is where we have a world that is infused with the concept of an inevitable AI revolution an inevitable point where computers will become sentient and start running the show. I think it's part of our culture at the moment where that's just something that's very strong in the idea space. And I think that's very interesting. But the problem is that often the word AI or an artificial intelligence gets bandied about very quickly. A lot of the things that we see that we sort of assume are kind of artificial intelligence are not really that intelligent, um, but they are very artificial. 
And I think it's important to make the distinction that if you're seeing some of the sort of more recent developments in computers basically making art kind of by themselves, kind of with some inputs, again, hard to say, that's not really artificial intelligence, right? The thing is not sentient, it's not conscious, it's not really making those choices, it's a tool. And tools have been used by artists for a long time. And this concept of the revolution happening is something that I think has been happening for a long time. It's not something new. Now, that's an important distinction because often what happens is that companies and people sort of label things in a particular way in order to sort of have effective marketing get different funding and you can kind of see these things roll through silicon valley every sort of five years at one point it's all about again sort of autonomous cars then it's it's about deep learning it's here it's vr then it's ar you have to be careful about a lot of these terms because in many cases they are sort of words that are being used it's important to understand that it is just a concept and I think often what happens is we grow up in a sea of this idea that there is an inevitable AI sentient sort of thing that's going to happen, right? You can listen to Ray Kurzweil or any of these people talk about a singularity where, and that's, it's, it's a bit late, it's meant to have happened already, where computers will become conscious and then they'll start learning and evolving at sort of an exponential rate. And then it's all over. Again, these are ideas made up by people. And often they're sort of made up by people for not necessarily good reasons, right? They're often made up for, you know, to, to attempt to market to people, to get power, to get money. The important thing to look at is what's actually happening. What does it actually do? Most of these AI systems are still at this point just tools. They're things where you can use them to generate images, but they're not something that is necessarily going to replace a job at the moment. Now, I guess the question is, well, oh, but because I watched Terminator um, and because I've watched all these TV shows that are fantasies made up by people and you hear scientists who, again, are often sort of shilling for their own funding to say, yeah, like, give me more money to make it this AI stuff because... Uh, you know, it's going to be the next big thing. Again, you don't know. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. And in many cases, even though you can see the inevitability of a lot of technological revolutions, the way that it actually rolls out is often not exactly how people um, thought it was going to roll out. So you do have to make that distinction. This is just a name. It's not necessarily a sentient thing that is going to take your job at this point. And I think we're a long, long, long way off from that point. Now, if you were to look at sort of my general sort of thesis, you can look at, there's a great conversation that uh, Lex Friedman interviewed uh, Sir Roger Pemrose, and they sort of talk about, you know, what is the nature of consciousness and what is the nature of AI? And I think he basically talks about it as being something that is not going to be computationally possible. It's something where there is some quantum level of intelligence going on that kind of makes consciousness and sentience sort of happen. And that's more how I view the concept of artificial intelligence. I think we're a long way off. And I think a lot of the chatter is people basically making very sophisticated automation, which is super useful and super impressive. The idea of it being intelligent, uh, I'm not sure. The reason that, again, I watch these things and I'm interested in AI, even though, you know, I sort of draw in a very sort of simple style is because I'm writing a science fiction book where I have to consider what artificial intelligence might be in the future. But more on that later, because I think that does play directly into what we're talking about. Now, the second thing here is that this is, as I said, just some form of fancy automation. It's essentially a filter or a script. It's very sophisticated and it shows a lot of promise, but it is the same thing that's been happening for a long time. If we analyze this from basic first principles of economics, because... If you just want to make art, you make art. Doesn't uh, don't don't listen to anyone who says, "Oh, you can or can't make art from this and whatever." If you just want to make art, make art. What we're really talking about is jobs and money. Uh, can we, you know, does this affect the marketplace? If we look at the marketplace, 
what is valuable is what is rare. And as we've seen more automation affect all industries, but you know, especially the art industry and technology change those things, what is sort of rare is always what's valuable. And as soon as something comes along that makes something that was rare a lot easier to do or increases the quality of it to a point where, again, you know, there, there's a massive competitive advantage. Photography would be a great example of that that sort of changed the illustration landscape, you know, very, very significantly. This thing's been happening for a long time and it's really just the same old story. Um, this happens again and again in video games and I think, again, I've been living through 20 years of a career and probably, you know, 25 plus years of me thinking about this and strategizing as a career and figuring out like, what do I do? How do I make money? You know, what's going to be the big next thing, et cetera, et cetera. This stuff kind of keeps rolling on and we have to adapt to it. And it's not all bad. A lot of these things are really good. A lot of the automations that we've sort of been able to achieve have given us a lot more creative control as artists. So there's often negatives and downsides and some people do lose their jobs. But your goal is to make sure that you navigate this journey on your own and make sure that you stay employable. Now, that's easier said than done, obviously. But it's also something that I think we are a little bit ahead of the curve on as artists who are existing in the digital realm. I think a lot of people are going to face very, very similar challenges where they're going to have to adapt to their careers and really, really think about what is the core of what they do and maybe build and be involved in multiple businesses over their lives to stay current and move with the technology. So if you're thinking, well, should I become an artist or should I do something more reliable? I don't know what else is more reliable. If AI becomes very, very sophisticated and starts running the show, it's really not going to matter whether you're an artist or not. In fact, I'd probably say being an artist where you can still have some small amount of uh, creativity where you're injecting your own unique personality into something is probably going to be way better than pretty much anything else. So the third thing is really just a meditation on the concept of foundation and understanding what tends to provide value in a marketplace as an artist. Now, again, I've done a variety of things as an artist over my career. I've drawn comics. I've worked in video games when video games were, you know, very early on when it was like PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2 development cycles. And, you know, I'm currently working in AAA games where the things that we do are very, very different. The skills you need are very different. But at its core, the thing that I always wanted to do was design things and create things and make things interesting and tell stories. And the way that I do that and the way that I feel doesn't really change depending on you know the way that the technology moves. It's very important to understand how your art foundation affects all of these concepts. And by art foundation, I mean, yes, you should still study drawing. You should still study how to, you know, draw and paint. It doesn't have to be traditionally. It can be digitally. But to think about how you handle that traditional sort of style of art education, because there's a lot of flexibility that that gives you because the things that you actually do and the trials and tribulations that you face as you pursue that goal will make you understand the world and the concept of design and the nature of creation at a very deep level. And it's hard to get the same sort of feeling, again, if you're just kind of pressing a bunch of automated buttons. And there's a lot of sort of intuitive understanding of the world and, as I said, of the creative process that comes from dealing with those creative challenges over the years and potentially decades as you perfect your craft. The thing that often makes a difference and makes someone more employable is often their very specific interests. And this is something that's hard to replicate. The concept of building some AI that is going to replace this is, I think, a lot trickier than people understand. And I think this is a very difficult concept to understand yourself if you're just beginning your journey because when I was just beginning my journey, the idea of getting a job was so otherworldly 
um, of doing art for a career or, you know, getting some building, basically making something that, you know, people would pay me money for in some way, some artistic thing. And I think the more that you progress through your career, the more you understand, and I think this is fairly universal, is that the things that tend to differentiate you, once you've sort of built a certain degree of craft, are often the things that are very personal to you. And it's those things that are actually a lot more important than just sort of painting the picture. And if you sort of build teams of people and you try and sort of solve these goals together, it's often not just what you can do, but it's what you plus the person next to you, plus the person next to you, plus the person next to you can do together. It's that complexity that, again, I think AI systems are just going to have a huge, huge problem. Again, until they get to some sort of quantum level of uh, computation or, or some sort of other way of thinking about it. Um, the problem and the challenge is a lot bigger than that. And often what people are looking for when they're employing you is your own unique interests and your own specific take on things. The things that you will kind of, you know, really fight for. The things that you don't care about. Your particular take on the world. Your deeper understanding of your sort of hobbies or little things that actually make you valuable on a team. Um, you'd be surprised how much of a difference this makes to things being real and actually being able to provide real value in a team. So, you know, I work in a team where there's a variety of people and they all have different backgrounds and skill sets. And that's invaluable. I don't think that having some automated solution where you just kind of get provided a end result that you can kind of pick from is the same. Because part of it is being able to discuss as a group how we got here and what we could change and to have these sort of complicated discussions about where we're going and how we're going to get there and what should this design, what should this spaceship look like, what should this character look like. It's not just a matter of spitting out an answer. It's often the unique things that you bring to the table that actually make the whole process possible and spit out the really unique, interesting results at the end. And even though it might not seem like it, because often in the beginning, what you're doing is just struggling to get the craft together to get a job doing anything. But as you progress... And as you build your skills, I think what you'll find it is those specific things that are unique to you, which are actually going to make the difference when it comes to income and you being sort of replaceable by either someone else who's going to do the job cheaper, which is actually probably way, way, way more of a challenge for a lot of people in Western um, sort of societies worrying about like whether a computer is going to take your job. No, no, worry about whether people from a different country who can do it for half or an eighth or a tenth of the price can, can take your job, right? Again, there's lots of challenges. The thing that will give you job security is being easy to work with, being interesting and being able to provide those specific things that are really unique to you and make you special and valuable. The fourth thing is that design is hard. Now, if, we think, if, we, if we're talking about art, art really is much more personal. It's much more subjective. If you're just thinking, hey, I want to be an artist, um, there are a bunch of business models you can use to basically just sell stuff through social media and create a following and serve that following and make things that make other people happy. Most of the time, they're going to buy those things from you because you're you. And they're not going to buy them from someone else because that person got an AI sort of software automated thing to make it for them because that is not rare in the marketplace. It's very obvious. Again, when you first see these things happening, that seems sort of fresh and new. They seem fresh and new. But eventually, things that are automated and sort of easy to do just sort of flood the market become really boring and everyone gets sick of it and no one buys it anymore. People are often buying from you because you're you if you're an artist. That's kind of the whole point. If we look at design, which, as I've said previously in other videos, is often where there's more sort of job opportunities currently in the entertainment industry. This is where you're basically working in a large production environment and you're sort of doing art that is headed towards the goal of creating some big product or something similar. Right, working in animation, video games, film, 
um, you know, sort of illustration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All these are situations where you're trying to meet a brief. You're trying to do a particular thing. This is very hard. This is a hard thing to do, and it actually quite requires quite a bit of IQ, of intelligence, of intention, of thinking. It's not something where you can just kind of let muddle your way through it. It's actually a really, really challenging concept to take a mix of functionality, visual design, visual trends, what's worked for the last hundred years, what's really hot now, what's functional, what's already been done, what, what are people thinking about, and combining that with some form of intuition, working with a whole bunch of other people who've got other ideas for this, trying to make your art director happy, trying to make your creative directors happy, trying to you know do all these things and juggle all these bits and pieces is often what makes up the design process. And it's really hard. I think a lot of people who get into, you know, who, who like art kind of get turned off by the design process because it can be very intellectual and it does require you to be able to think about a lot of very abstract concepts and combine them together. So it's not something where it's just a matter of spitting out, again, an automated sort of filtered image. There's a lot of thought that goes on here. And my experience of this is that it's very challenging. And I think it's going to take a genuinely intelligent artificial intelligence, something that actually can understand a huge variety of things to have uh, any ability to make any dent in that process whatsoever. Doesn't mean that that's not going to be used as a tool. Because, again, a lot of the people who are working as designers are quite good at using these technological advancements to help the process, to help the ideation phase, and to basically create a better product. And things like 3D, photos, and basically whatever you can do to produce a better product and design a better product and ideate what that product will look like and think about you know getting your design of it as close to the finished product as possible, people do. And people have been bashing away at that for the last 20 years, 30 years, and before that, again, there's, there's no end to the degree to which designers will go to fulfill a brief. That's just the nature of it. So, you know, that's why you often have like a lot of concept artists and people who are in the design industry are very interested in these AI software programs like, uh, again, Midjourney or any of these other ones. And uh, because that's just what we do, you know, you just kind of suck up that, oh, this is cool, I'll play around with this, maybe give me some ideas, I can combine this with this. Again, that's still a person using it as, it as a tool. So, the fifth thing really is just to sum up all of those concepts and say that change is constant in pretty much all industries. And I think one of the biggest dangers you can have is to be distracted from building core competencies and really figuring out what you want to do on this earth in your lifetime. I've always never regretted the time that I've spent focusing on foundational concepts and really understanding how things are built at their most granular basic level. What I've often found is that, again, technology improves and, you know, that means that often the, the level of art that is required or expected improves as well. But that also, it, you know, offers up new areas of creativity. If we just use the simple concept of 3D being used as a part of illustration or concept design as an example, Yes, a lot of people use 3D in their concept art and the illustration these days. They either use it as a base to work out perspective or a lot of people are actually modeling pretty much everything and then just painting over it. Either way, the end result of what they're achieving is very similar. And, you know, very early on in the 60s and 70s when people were illustrating you know, science fiction book covers, they would be building little models out of plastic bottles and spray paint and photographing that. And this idea of adaptating and using skills um, that, you know, you might not expect to be, you know, sort of like used in one area and, uh, you know, doing whatever it takes to get an image is something that we've always been doing. Um, so you don't really have to worry about it. If people had 3D back in the day, they would have used it. Uh, as soon as people could use the camera obscura and these sort of concepts, they did, 
right? They just used those ideas and got really good at them. And that's something that always happens. It's been happening for a long time for me, and I think it will happen for a long time for you. The key is, what do you do about it? And how do you build a career? And what do you focus on to make sure that you can survive in this sort of choppy sea of change? That's what I want to talk about last. So the first thing I would say is don't let any portent of AI generated software taking your job stop you from building a foundation, especially if you're doing the kind of thing that I'm often talking about on this channel, which is drawing cartoony stuff. That's going to be one of the last things to go because I think that's going to be one of the hardest things to replicate and actually be effective. There are a lot of careers that are more focused on production art where again people are building things that software is going to find a lot easier to replicate or where you're going to be easily replaced by someone who can do the job for less or is willing to do the job for less or whether you're going to be replaced by asset libraries or something similar where people don't need to pay um, someone to model a tree because they can just buy a pack of trees for a low amount of money off an asset store and then use those instead. There's lots of career opportunities and things there where you can easily get replaced. If you're more at the ideation phase, at the concept phase, and you're really working to build your career and build your ability to design, I think you're going to be in much less danger of being replaced. And I think Art Foundation has a lot to do with that. The foundation and the process that you go through um, by learning concepts such as, again, if we're just talking about drawing, for example, perspective, your rendering, all of your anatomical um, sort of knowledge, all of your compositional knowledge, how to make pictures. These things are not just skills that you bring, but it's the process and the unique way that you actually learn it that might be very specific to you. But also the process you go through to actually learn that informs not just your conscious mind, but your subconscious mind and gives you a lot of solid stuff to stand on, right? That's what we why we call it the foundation. It's the thing that you can build upon and it gives you flexibility. The best way to think about this is that often what if, if I take myself as an example, what I'm kind of interested in is characters, right? For instance, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to design characters because I've always liked to do that. And that's, you know, one of the things I do as a job. If I'm really interested in characters and I understand anatomy and I understand personality and I understand the concept of design and how to create a series of characters that are differentiated visually and how to you know make people feel a certain way how to distinguish people based on their societal role if we're creating npcs etc 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 it really doesn't matter what tool i use to get that job done i could use very simple drawings i could use um, you know very very detailed paintings i could mock that up in 3d I could use 3D as a base and then draw over it, or I could do a detailed drawing and then take it into 3D. You can do whatever you want as long as you get the job done. And what I found is that the tool that I use really is just going to be the one that's going to be the most effective. And what I found, for instance, is that because... I draw in a very sort of cartoony style, it's often sort of quicker and easier for me to just do that kind of work in 2D. But I have found a lot of scenarios where using 3D would sort of help me. And in that case, I do. And even though I don't really like doing 3D stuff, I much prefer to, you know, build a 3D model of a character and then hand that off to a modeler than I do having to draw an orthographic front, back, side view of a character. Why? Because drawing orthographics is kind of boring, and anyone who works in concept art will know exactly that. It's a really boring part of the job. You design the character, and then it's like, okay, we'll draw the front and the back and the side, make them all line up. Ah, oh, it's so boring. If I just do that in 3D, and then I use that 3D base to either draw over, or we can just hand that to the modeler, um, you know, so they can understand the proportions that I was dealing with, and then overlay the details of the drawing that I used there. Uh, to me, I'm like, I don't care. Uh, I had fun. I designed the character, and when the character is actually made and walking around, I can see 
the effect that I had on the finished result. Now, again, you know, depending on what you like doing or not like doing, you can move away from or towards particular tasks and, you know, try and modify your career so you're doing exactly the things that you really, really enjoy doing. But at the end of the day, what I found is that you don't need to jump on a lot of these technological advancements early on. If we look at 3D as an example, I could have started using ZBrush when it first came out. I knew about it. I tried it. I did sculpting. I knew how to use 3D. I've known how to use 3D for, again, over 20 years. Um, but I do very little of it. And what I found is if I just kind of sit back and wait, the tool gets so easy to use that, you know, it only takes me a couple of weeks to kind of learn how to use something like ZBrush or Blender. And obviously it takes, you know, a little bit longer to get really good at it. But the tools improve and get really good. And you're not necessarily best off jumping on these kind of new advancements early on. Unless something, unless that's something you're really interested in. I know a lot of people enjoy being the avant-garde, the advanced guard of people who are at the bleeding edge of technology. And if that's you, if you really like playing with things, then go for it. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there and you should really, really enjoy doing that. But for me, I'm not like that. I like sort of drawing stuff. So I use these things as tools and I found that that idea has helped me a lot. So... Think about more, think about this more as what do you actually want to do? What is the meaning of it as opposed to what tool you use? You might have your special tool and if you get really good at it, you can often find that you can do things faster than somebody can do it using their sort of newfangled technology. Um, because again, if you get really good at using a particular tool, again, that will be valuable on the team and people might want you to do that because again, it gives things a particular spin. Anyway, I can keep going on this basic concept, but all I can say is that the foundation and really understanding what is at the core of what makes your work valuable is where you need to think. And if you spend, you know, three or four years out of, you know, a, a lifelong career trying to work on your drawing and really kind of figure this out and build a foundation, it's a drop in the bucket. It's not really going to make any difference in the long term. And I think you're much better off spending your time there, pretty much as much time as you can spend there, um, as opposed to trying to think about which software to use and try and strategize how to kind of, you know, stay ahead of the curve there. Again, you know specifically who you are and what you're good at and, and where your kind of strengths and weaknesses lie. But again, there's many paths to success here as long as you focus on doing things that are valuable and challenging at the same time because that will normally mean they're going to be valuable in a marketplace but rare because other people don't want to do them or can't do them the other thing to really think about here is that the main reason you're going to be employable is because you're helpful and i think if you focus on developing your skills and building up your techniques and your folio and all of these concepts so that you're building them to help people and help teams and be valuable in a production chain, then that's something where, again, what you're building is that muscle of being helpful, being useful, and making sure that the things you're doing are focused on helping the people around you. That is really often what you're actually getting paid to do. There's the art, and some people can be really good at it, and some people are just good at it. But what makes the difference is can you actually put that power to the ground and help your team to create something really, really amazing? If you focus on that, I think overall you'll be a lot happier. And I think it's more important to do that and find other people you want to work with who agree with your kind of way of solving these problems. And again, if you're not interested in a lot of high AI software generated art and sort of modern ways of sort of developing art, you can probably find companies where, again, other people feel the same way and you'll create stuff in your own way. And uh, again, as long as you can still produce the product and make something really cool that people like, then uh, no one's really going to care how it was done. So what I can leave you with lastly, again, is just an example of my own career and how these things can evolve and change. And you can be doing one thing which is advanced and some things which are not advanced. As I said, I'm very interested in the concept of artificial intelligence and futurism 
and what will happen. These things are super, super interesting to me. And I've always been fascinated by the march of technology. I listen to people talk about what sentience and consciousness means because I'm writing a science fiction comic. And as I've said, it's often our ancillary interests and the subtleties that make up our personality and skill stack that actually lead to some of the best opportunities and us staying employed. In this case, I'm interested in science fiction, artificial intelligence, what it might mean to have sentient AI races in the future. And that's one of the things that helps me get that project. Again, the thing is that I'm doing that using techniques that are hundreds of years old. The techniques that I do um, implement are the same ones that you would see Hal Foster create Prince Valiant with. Um, almost a hundred years ago, or Windsor McKay create Little Nemo in Slumberland, or any of the other things that he created, including the first animations that eventually inspired Disney to create the Disney films. It's the same thing. I'm just drawing lines and adding color. It's not really the drawing that is the important thing. It's often the interests and the other things that I bring to it and the specific sort of mix of stuff that I've sort of built up. And I have found that to be the case in my career. So it's not always a matter of just everything new. There's often innovation and interesting things can happen by combining old things and new things and creativity. And what you constantly have to be doing is looking out for opportunities. It would be very easy for me to be making no money, just as it would be you know, possible for me to make a living drawing comics or doing concept art. It just comes down to understanding what is at the core of what you want to do and looking for opportunities. And those things, in my experience, have constantly changed, constantly evolved. And I've really never known where things are going to go, where new opportunities are going to come from. And when they come up and people you know, ask me how did that happen, I'm often just like, I don't know, it just happened. I was doing this thing and then this thing and this technological advancement and the technological advances that essentially allow me to create my own comics are really good. We've got tons of automation. We've got programs, software. I can do my own sort of lettering. I can do all this stuff in Photoshop. This is all because of technology. And I think at the bottom line is that it often actually inspires people and allows people to do more on their own and automate a lot of this other stuff out of there so that you can you know actually control more of the finished product and be more of an auteur which i think is funnily enough kind of the opposite of this idea of some you know ai software sort of taking everything over and making everything very robotic i think often what it'll do is allow a lot more creative expression a lot more options and it's often it actually takes a long time for people to actually realize what their options are and how technological how technological change actually affects people and you know makes things bad and makes things you know not bad so you really have to stay on your toes if you're gonna do art or anything else as a career the more you can be open to change but also focus on the core of what you're good at and really make sure you always stay true to yourself i think the better you'll be overall in the long run ai software and whatever these things are these automated sort of filter fractal program whatever they're doing is really cool i love it it's sort of super interesting to see the art that gets created by these things these are just tools this has just been happening for hundreds of years um, get used to it and don't freak out about it draw some cool stuff have fun drawing stuff from your imagination and embrace the challenge of drawing. Work on your foundation. I think it will serve you very well. And just remember that being able to create stuff from your imagination is the most fun thing. That's what I enjoy doing. I don't want or I don't care about some other stupid AI doing my art for me. I want to do it my way and I want to do it from my imagination. Anyway, that's all I got for this one. We'll catch you around. Happy drawing.